Hey guys, how are ya? <clears throat> I got a shirt that says, it is what it is. It is what it is. Pray again that the internet connection will remain strong. I expect it to buffer, but glory to Jesus Christ is 99% better than it was when I first tried to use the internet here. So don't panic. You know, Ibn al welcome, everyone welcome. And we have our brother first and last, Ahmad, who will be helping me to help you, serving me to serve you for the glory of Jesus Christ. Because today <clears throat> I was going to, just let you know, yesterday I was going to do a live stream, but I got caught up. And when I came back, David Wood and Michael Brown were on an excellent discussion on Muhammad and the Bible. Michael Brown, if you guys don't know, is in my estimation the leading Jewish Christian apologist refuting rabbinic Judaism. He is the leading Jewish Christian scholar on issues related to rabbinic Judaism and Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah. <clears throat> he is a nightmare to rabbinic Judaism. And he's also one of the leading voices on LGBTQ and homosexual agenda. So praise God for that man. I pray the Lord Jesus will continue to use him mightily for the glory of Christ, right? For his glory, the glory of Jesus. <clears throat> and so I didn't want to obviously live stream. And by the time they were done, it was kind of late for people in the UK. So I'm trying to time it where I can get the most people from the United States and Europe, <clears throat> right? So hopefully what I'm going to do now, I got a whole slew of links to articles, rebuttals you need to read. Articles that you need to either upload to your website, print out, or save and read them. I'm giving you <clears throat> lots and lots of articles. So that means glory to the triune God, glory to the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. This time of isolation, when you have time alone because you can't go to work, kids are asleep, whatever, start reading them. <clears throat> Study them and then apply them for the glory of Jesus Christ. So I got a lot of articles for you guys. And Lord willing, I plan on doing another session for the benefit of those who just came out of a particular religion or no religion at all and are now worshiping Jesus Christ. And those who've been in the faith but may not understand this teaching of the Bible. So God willing, in a few hours, if you guys want me to, and if you guys will show up, I want to do a talk on being born again. Being born again. Why does the scriptures teach the necessity and the importance of being born again? When our Lord Jesus Christ in John 3 verse 3 says you must be born again, what does that mean and why? <clears throat> because there are even Christians who've been walking with Jesus who still don't, don't understand that. So I pray that these ideas, these sessions are from the Spirit, meaning that the Holy Spirit is putting these things in my heart because that's what the Holy Spirit wants me to talk about. Because if it's from the Holy Spirit, we will be blessed, we will be challenged, we will be transformed, we will be convicted, we will be stretched, and we will be purged and purified by the Spirit and the blood of Jesus Christ, right? But I want you guys to let me know if that's what you want me to do. <clears throat> because the other day when I did two sessions, many people said they'd come, fewer came than for the first session, right? And I, I want more people to study this information. And I'm going to give you two testimonies of enemies of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Two testimonies from the enemies of the cross of Jesus Christ, from the enemies of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Those who hate the true Jesus, even though they claim they love Jesus, and hate those who are servants of the true Jesus, who love the true Jesus. I'm going to give you two testimonies. When your enemies praise you, that should strengthen you, strengthen you, and <clears throat> embolden you to know and increase your confidence that the material you're receiving, and that's not just for me, I just want to be clear, the material that you're receiving from these sessions, the material that you're receiving from Jesus' name, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Man, what it buffers, I get angry. I don't want to just like lose my testimony. Sorry about that. Like I said, it's going to buffer here and there. The materials that you're receiving from David Wood, myself, Anthony Rogers, right? These are materials, answers, arguments, objections that have been tested in spiritual battle, refined and perfected by the Spirit. So you owe it to yourselves to study this material, to know your faith much more 
deeply to have greater confidence and trust that you have the true faith and the true understanding of the Bible and that the God of the Bible is real. He lives. He is life. He is alive. He is reality. Right. So I just want to make sure. So if you guys are ready, we're going to wait a few more minutes, but I'm going to share the testimony. Others can come back <clears throat> and listen to this from the beginning. Are you guys ready for these two testimonials? One comes from a Muslim who took a snippet of my talk. This tells you, by the way, this tells you, Muslims are watching me. That tells you all glory to the triune God, all glory to the in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, crucify my flesh, throw my crown on the eye. All glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. All glory to his grace and compassion on a wicked sinner. May he save me from my own sinful passions to walk worthy of him. <clears throat> his favor is upon us so evident that even the enemies of the cross fear us because of Jesus. Okay? One comes from a Muslim who took a snippet of my talk that I did. Was it Sunday? On Sunni Islamic beliefs critiqued. He took a snippet of my talk. And he made a clip of it, right? And the other comes from a Unitarian who made a comment after my debate with Andrew Griffin, the debate I had. You guys ready? You want me to read it? Or you guys are like, oh, man, I want to check out. I'm done. All right. Well, let me just, this is, okay, this is diet, right? Here's what the Muslim said. <clears throat> Watch here. This is glory to God, but I, the reason I'm sharing it because I want this to strengthen you in your confidence in these materials that you are receiving from us. Okay, here you go. <clears throat> he puts the clip. Sam Shimon exposes. Sam Shimon, Lord Jesus, bless the internet connection for your glory, Lord. You don't need me. We need you. Sam Shimon exposes the truth about Islam. Right? And then Adnan Rashid, a Muslim apologist, he goes, LOL, mashallah, mashallah. This guy knows Islam. Notice, when your enemy confirms you know their religion, that is a compliment. This guy knows Islam and still rejects it. Of course, it's the reason why I reject it is because I know it. Because I know it, I reject it because it's of the devil. Right? It is Allah who knows the guided ones. And then another guy, Moodles, Mumtawilip, I have no idea how to say his name. MashaAllah, this is amazing. MashaAllah, this is amazing. John Isaac, come and see. Very soon, David Wood is joining him to say the same about Islam. So they took a clip that I said that Islam is all-encompassing, and they're praising Allah. And notice my enemies bearing witness to the favor of God upon us. This guy knows Islam. You see it? You see it? And I want you to glorify the Father, Son, and Spirit. I want you to glorify Jesus Christ for raising up sinners imperfect fallen human vessels <clears throat> granting the spirit who perfects us to become more like jesus though we still struggle with our sinful body and passions and then anoints them in such a way that even the enemies of the cross have to acknowledge the blessing of god upon us now let me read to you what the Unita unitarian said about my debate are you ready you ready for his confession what a unitarian said Okay, here you go. Who's ready? Tell me if you're ready. Okay, let's see. Rivers O'Feeden, he's posted a comment on Trinity's po podcast that's run by one of the most nastiest, most vilest, wicked, demonic anti Trinitarian out there. I cannot stand him. I have no respect for him. His name is Dale Tuggy. How I pray God will allow me to debate him. Because I will decimate him spiritually by the grace of God. But be that as it may, and I hope he's watching this. I cannot stand you, Dale Tuggy. And if you are a man and you have confidence, debate me on the Trinity and see what I'll do to you by the grace of Jehovah Jesus, your God and judge. Yeah. Now, yeah, and, and Michael Brown schooled him. But I'll do much, I'll do greater damage because Michael Brown is a nice guy. Okay, now, here's what he says. I just listened to the debate from the other night with Sam Shimon and Andrew, Andrew Griffin. This is a Unitarian. This was another, this was another in a recent series of disappointments for biblical Unitarians. <clears throat> Griffin's performance was embarrassing. I have to commend the Trinitarian in this debate for being very well prepared 
and asking excellent exegetical questions that were relevant to the topic. Let me repeat it again, folks. Let me repeat it again. I have to commend the Trinitarian, that means me, in this debate <clears throat> for being very well prepared and asking excellent exegetical questions that were relevant to the topic. All Griffin did was recklessly parrot whatever he could remember reading a Bible commentary or Philo. I hope other biblical Unitarians who listen to this debate will realize why teaching and debating isn't for everyone. This was yet another opportunity completely wasted. Now notice the enemy of the true God, the true Jesus, praising the Lord for his gift on us. And notice his admit, admission, excellent exegetical questions that were relevant to the topic. This is an indirect admission on his part that my interpretation was sound. Exegesis means to interpret the Bible properly and correctly. Eisegesis is to read into the Bible and twist it to agree with your position. He just admit my exegesis was excellent and relevant. So he's admitting I interpret the Bible correctly. So then why are you still a Unitarian? So this is a concession that the Lord will use against him on the day of judgment if he doesn't repent. You see? So why did I share this with you? Honestly, may God purify my heart. I'm not doing it for praise and say I'm this. I'm not. I am honestly, the Lord knows. I know I am nothing. I know I am a sinful, wicked, <clears throat> fallen creature. And I know my desperate need of Jesus. And I, I know that I need Jesus to love me and pity me and preserve me and even save me from myself. I know this. I am not saying this. I said, no, because I'm trying to show you our Lord Jesus is real. He is alive. He's mighty. He's almighty over creation. And in his love, he raises fallen, imperfect vessels like me and gives us gifts to then build up the body of Christ so they have no doubt that he is risen. He is Lord. The Bible is his word. You understand my point? I know. Listen, folks, people don't need to tell me my, I know my issues, impatience, angry. And I, I'm telling you, I came out of my mother's womb angry. I was angry that, you know, I came out of my mother's womb angry. So, but why am I sharing this with you? Is because I want you to have confidence in using these <clears throat> sessions and articles. I want you to be soldiers, warriors, filled with the Holy Spirit to glorify Jesus Christ. And not just in your preaching, but the way you live. And pray that pray that for me. I am weak. I am broken. And I do struggle with sinful passions. Ask Jesus to give me victory to die to my flesh and not succumb and to walk worthy of him. I need that. So if you love me for the sake of the Lord, pray hard for me that God will make me a pure holy slave. Keep emboldening me to speak the truth and live it and to serve you and bless you and to provide for my daughters and I. My, my favor from the Lord would be, he gives me the grace to never shame him, but to love him and live for him and finish this race and to see my daughters grow up to be godly women in love with Jesus. And if he tarries, I leave this earth before they do. Right. So. OK, so now with that said, we love you, Father, and we love you, Lord Jesus, and we love you, Holy Spirit. And shamefully, I don't love you perfectly, not because I don't want to, Father. Because it's so easy to succumb to the flesh. And I ask, Lord, for the power of the Holy Spirit, conquer and crucify my flesh. I yield to you. We yield to you. We submit to your spirit. Fill us with your Holy Spirit to die to the flesh and walk in the life and the power of the Holy Spirit. To pray intensely. To fast intensely. To sing your praises. To study your word. To meditate upon your word. To, to make an effort to live it and obey it. And to love our brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ by our actions. And our neighbors by our actions. Shining with the beauty of Jesus Christ. May Jesus increase in us, Father. May we decrease. May he sit in the throne upon our hearts, Father, and the hearts of our loved ones, my two angels, even their mother. Let the Lord Jesus sit in the throne upon their hearts. Cover them, cover us, cover our loved ones with the blood of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus. Wash us in the blood of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus. Flood us in your living waters, your Holy Spirit. And Father, please bless this session. Lord, bless this session. Save me from error and stammering and confusion. Bless this session for, for the glory of Jesus Christ, your heart who that became flesh. Bless my brothers and sisters to understand, to grow, to fall more passion love with Jesus and strengthen them and their faith to never doubt that you are truly God and to cling to you, cling to Christ, cling to his cross and be 
<clears throat> sealed by the Spirit. And I pray that for myself as well, Abba. And Lord, I pray you bring many more to these sessions. And Lord, if you are pleased that I do another session in the power of the Holy Spirit on being born again, a crucially important doctrine of your word, the Holy Bible. Lord, enable me to recall these passages and interpret them correctly. And fill my lungs and my chest and throat with the breath of life. And make the sound of my voice pleasing to the ears of your servants for the sake of Jesus. Have your way. And not just in these sessions, but also have your way with us every day, Father. Every second, every minute of our existence on earth. You are our life. Jesus is our life. The Holy Spirit is our life. Give us the grace to live for you. Please, Abba. Lord, help us. Save us from our flesh. Lord Jesus, please help us. We love you, Lord. We love you, Holy Spirit. Have your way in Jesus' name. Yeah, Abba, Paul, so Spirit. Right. You guys ready? You excited? Yeah, that's beyond my control, Jesus, Lord. By the way, don't forget, honestly, if there was a favor I ask of you, make sure you invite people to the session on being born again. Lord willing, and about two hours after this session is done, God willing, I'm coming back to do a series on being born again, right? But please invite people, especially Christians. Christians need to know this doctrine, okay? Now, are you ready for the articles? I got a lot. Yeah, and I will, Mike. Like I said, if the Lord keeps me pure and is not grieved with me and casts me aside and he gives me the health, Mike, I'll be talking about all these essential doctrines of the Christian faith, right? Right? I'll be talking all these things. And one reason why I want to talk about being born again, because there are at least three Muslims <clears throat> that listen. Ibn al-Khan, ex-Muslim and daughter of Christ, and I want them to know what the Bible teaches about the new birth. Okay? But now, get ready for the articles. There's too many of them. There's too many of them. God bless you, Kevin Drake. And Lord Jesus bless you for being gracious enough to tolerate me, Kevin Drake. And I pray I'm a blessing to you even when I'm tough with you. All right? So I hope you don't mind. It's tough love, brother. I don't know why. Honestly, if you ask me before I give you the links, if you ask me why am I so impatient and angry, I have no clue. I really don't, honestly, by way of, I don't know. Why do I get angry so fast and why am I so impatient? Like, wow, man. I mean, what is there for me to be angry about? I'm a stunningly good looking Assyrian. I'm a handsome beast, right? I have charisma oozing out of my pores. I'm often imitated, never duplicated, right? I'm a prophet and a poet, now you know it. What's there to be angry about, man? Everything. You know, I got mental issues. Are you ready for the articles? And God willing, thank our brothers and sisters who regularly pray for these sessions and the ministry. And thank the mods, first and last. They they help beatify my YouTube channel. And they take the links and they put them in the description box. So here you go. Article number one. Article number one. I'm going to post the link to each article twice. Click on them. Save them. Let me repeat, you don't need to ask me. You have my permission to upload them to your website, to your YouTube uh, channel, to print them out, even make clips of the videos like the Muslim did. You see the Muslim? The Muslim is actually doing what I'm telling Christians to do. He's taking a clip of my session and putting it on his YouTube channel. If the Muslims are doing it, please, Christians, do it. Spread it. But just keep the URL intact and the name of the article and the author intact. And please, freely receive, freely you shall give. You don't charge for this. But in case you do, you're going to have to give me 95% of everything you make. Okay, but anyway, that's the first article, okay? Are you ready? There's a lot of articles. One brother in the Lord said he didn't come to my live stream because it was a topic on Islam. And I had to rebuke him in love because he doesn't understand <clears throat> that... These sessions on Islam are important for two reasons. So that's the second article. Let me give you the link twice, okay? Save it. Two reasons why these sessions are important. Number one, whether you like it or not, you need to evangelize. You need to preach the gospel to all nations. And Muslims make up a great bulk of the population. Whether you like, like it or not, you need to pray for their salvation and love them enough to preach the gospel to them. So you need to know what Muslims believe to preach the gospel, number one. That's the first reason. If you love Jesus, you got to love Muslims to preach to them. The second reason is, though I'm talking about Islam, I'm bringing it back to Christ. I'm bringing it back to the Bible. 
So you're still going to learn about your faith, just like the other day when I did the second session on Islam, Sunni Islamic Beliefs Critique Part 2. The entire session was the religion of the prophets. What was their religion? And I showed you that from Abraham all the way to the last prophet Malachi, they were Christians who knew Jesus, trusted in Jesus, loved Jesus, and worshipped him even before Jesus became flesh. So you are shortchanging yourself and you're doing yourself a disservice when you don't come to a session that's Islamically related. Yes, I don't like to talk about Islam as much as I like to talk about the Christian faith in the Bible. But still, we need to talk about this religion and other religions like Unitarians, Joe's Witnesses, to learn what they believe and then bring it back to the Bible and destroy their objections and arguments to take them captive for Jesus. Okay? Now, that was the second article. Here's the third article. Guys, I'm telling you, a lot of articles. And thou shalt not pontificate. Make sure you pass these articles on to Daughter of Christ, Ibn Khan, and others. Lots of meat. Thank God that you're being quarantined because you're going to need eight hours just to read this stuff. Now, here's the third article. But with that said, let me emphasize. The most important thing you can do, study the Bible, either by reading it or playing the Bible where it's being read to you. Number one, read your Bible or hear your Bible. That is the word of God. Not my articles, not David Wood's sessions. Listen to the voice of God. Read your Bible. Meditate upon it. That's number one. Related to it, cry out to the Lord daily. Get up and thank him that he is your God and he loves you and that he will preserve you. Thank him. And then make your needs known to him and then rest in him. Worship him. Then... You listen to sermons, watch sessions, and read articles. But that's your priority now. And even fast. Take this time to fast. Okay, that was the third article. Here's the fourth article. The fourth article. My articles are not God-breathed. My sessions are not inspired by the Spirit. No one who teaches, preaches, or debates have the authority that the apostles... And the writers of the Bible, the prophets, the authors of Scripture did, they were inspired in a unique, divine manner to give us God's word perfectly and flawless, and that now it's preserved by God. Everyone else after them, we are not inspired. We can make mistakes. We don't see things clearly, right? Even though I'm the closest thing to being infallible. I am the Protestant Pope. No, I'm just kidding. Okay, that was now article what? Let's see if you're paying attention. That was what? B, how many articles so far? Let's see if you're paying attention. How many articles? Four, right? See, I thought it was three. See, I was setting up. See, Shazad says three. You need to repent. Are you sure it's four? Because now I'm confused. Okay, four. I forgot myself. Shazad Masihi. You need to face the East and repent. Okay, that's the fourth article. All right, here's another one. Here's the fifth article. <whistles> Beauties. <whistles> Ver, what do you make? Beauties. That's the fifth article. Folks, I told you we have over 200 articles on the website, but you guys don't believe me. No, no. Sam, you're just a liar. They're, okay. Here's the sixth article. Okay. Chazot Masihi. You have permission to download my videos and put subtitles. I've given permission to everyone. That was the fifth article, right? Very nice. I like. All right. Here is the sixth article. I don't know if this is the last one. I don't know. I even lost can, count. Pass it on. Sixth article. And you can even take snippets and clips. Praise the Lord for Revelation 22, 13, and Psalm 23. Their YouTube channels, that's what they do. They take snips, snippets, snippets, clips, and our videos, CP, myself, and David, and download it or upload it, whatever you want to call it. Is it download, upload? You say potato, I say potato. And they upload it, download it to their YouTube channels. That was what? The sixth article? I don't know anymore, man. Okay, anyway. Save it. I have no idea. Okay, that was it. You got everything now. Okay, you guys got all the articles. I'll give you a minute to click on them. Click on them. Save them. Let me repeat. You have my permission. Upload them to your website. Print them. Use them, please, for the glory of the triune God. That's that's nothing. I, I had a lot more, but I was going to give you too many.
So that said, are we ready to talk about another article of Sunni Islamic faith where I'm going to now use the Quran to prove that Jesus is better than Muhammad, superior to Muhammad, even though the Jesus of the Quran is not the true Jesus. Let me repeat. Let me repeat. The Jesus of the Quran is a satanic counterfeit. The God of the Quran is a satanic counterfeit. The Quran is a counterfeit of Satan to mislead people from the real Jesus. But with that said, with that said, God is sovereign enough, he's almighty enough to even use a satanic counterfeit to bring people to the true Jesus. So the Isa of the Quran is not the Jesus of history who is the Christ of the New Testament. But still, because God is almighty, he can use even a document that is intended to mislead people from the true Christ because he's almighty and sovereign over Satan and his schemes. Use even that to bring people to the true Christ. And he's done that. You'll hear testimonies of Muslims who just reading the Quran realized that the Jesus of the Quran was much better, superior to Muhammad, and was amazing. And that got them curious enough to come back to the true word of God, the New Testament, and discover the true Jesus. Do you know that? Many testimonies. Many testimonies. Exactly, Pedro. Let me repeat what he said. I just noticed that everyone wants to have their own Jesus. That shows how special Jesus is. Let me tell you why. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 11, verses 2 to 4. Let's unpack why. Paul told us by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Uh, hallelujah, world changer. God never leaves himself without a witness. Exactly, Shahazot. Read with me, folks. This is where I need you to pay attention. Read. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. <clears throat> but I fear lest by any means as a serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, through his cunning and deceit. So your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Now notice verse 4. Pay attention to verse 4. I'm going to unpack this. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, like the Islamic one, whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit, like the Islamic one, which ye have not received, or another gospel, like the Islamic one, which you have not accepted, you might well bear with him. Guys, please, for the sake of the Lord, I want to make sure you're understanding and listening. Help me to help you to make sure you're getting it. Let me break down what Paul just said. Paul just said that I'm presenting you as a chaste virgin daughter. Paul is describing his relationship to the Corinthian Christians that he converted as their spiritual father. Pay attention to the language. He's saying, I'm your spiritual father because the Lord used me to preach the gospel and give you spiritual birth. So you are my children through the preaching of the gospel spiritually. You are my daughter. As your spiritual father, I have already given you in marriage to Christ, your spiritual husband. And I'm presenting you as a spiritual virgin. Do not shame me. Do not dishonor me when Christ comes to consummate marriage with you and he finds you <clears throat> not to be a virgin. Do not lose your virginity and shame me when Christ comes to consummate the marriage with you. And he's talking spiritually, not physically, not sexually. So then how does a Christian lose his or her spiritual virginity? He says it because the serpent wants to entice you to commit spiritual adultery. He wants to defile you spiritually. He wants you to commit fornication, adultery with him spiritually. How does he get you to sleep with him spiritually? How does he get you to sleep with him spiritually? By putting up with false doctrine. So Satan seduces you to lose your spiritual virginity by having you accept another Jesus, whether the Muslim Jesus, the Unitarian Jesus, the Jehovah Witness Jesus, or the Mormon Jesus, or the, or the secular Jesus, or to receive a different spirit or believe a different gospel. Once you do, he has now defiled you. He's taken away your spiritual virginity. You've been defiled. You see how serious it is? You see how serious it is before I move on? I want to see if it sunk in. So, you are a spiritual virgin. Your spiritual husband is Christ. He's going to consummate the relationship spiritually. It's not physical. It's not sexual. Do not cheat on your husband 
and defile yourself spiritually so that when he shows up, he finds you tainted and no longer a spiritual virgin. That's what Paul is saying. Don't shame me. Don't dishonor me. Is that clear? Before I move on to the next point. I just want to make sure it sinks in. So that said, is since the Islamic Jesus is a counterfeit, since the Islamic Jesus is an attempt by Satan to seduce us, why then am I using the Quran to prove my case? Because the Bible writers would employ even the writings of the pagans to prove the truth of Christianity. So this is the second point I want you to remember. Learn these things. Learn these principles. Learn these truths. Right? The Bible writers themselves would use the writings, the sources of the pagans and their pagan poets and their pagan prophets to prove the truth of Christianity. Oh, yeah, Pedro. Let me show you. Acts 17, verse 28. Of course, man. Acts 17, verse 28. Here it is. Paul is preaching to the Athenians, to the Greeks. Areopagus, Mars Hill. Notice, Acts 17, 28. Notice, Pedro, what Paul quotes. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. You see what he's saying, Pedro? He's talking to the Greeks, and he's saying, even one of your own poets realize we are the offspring of God. He sustains us. He gives us life. Do you guys want to be shocked, though, with the citation? Any good Bible commentary, any good Bible study, study Bible, will tell you where he's quoting from. The quotation here that he's he's using to prove the truth that God is a father to all creation because he gives life to all creation, sustains all creation, so he is our father in that sense. Okay. You know that citation, that citation that he's quoting from a Greek poet? That poet was actually talking about Zeus. If you get a good commentary, it'll tell you this citation comes from this writer who is talking about Zeus, that we are the offspring of Zeus. Wow. Paul, you took a statement about Zeus and applied it to the true God. Did you know that? What's the point? Zeus is a false God. But what Paul is saying is that statement that that poet made about Zeus it is a true statement, but it's not about Zeus. It's about God. So it is true. We are God's offspring, but Zeus isn't God. The God I'm proclaiming, he is God. Exactly. Thank you, Ariel Gonzalez. Epimenides and Aratus. Aratas. Thank you. Are you with me there? Did it sink in that here you have a biblical principle showing you you can use the Quran? You can use the sources of the people that you're witnessing to. Even though these statements are made about a false god, you can take those statements and Christianize them and show them that statement is true because the true God is exactly that. So yes, when this was said of Zeus, it is true we're the offspring of God, but Zeus isn't God. That's where he was wrong. Yep, that's the name. Epimenides, Epimenides and Aratus, Eratos. Eratus. Eratus. Man, these names. Ooh. Is that clear? Now let me give you another place where Paul quotes a false prophet of the pagans to make his point. Titus 1 verse 12. Titus 1 verse 12. Not a true prophet of God. A false prophet. So when people tell me, brother, why are you quoting the Quran? Brother, don't you know that's the book of Satan? And... Titus 1.12. And? All truth is God's truth. Even if you find something true in a book that's satanic, that's God's truth. Then you, you reclaim it for God. Take it back for God. Hey, that's true, but not about your God, about my God. I claim that for my God. Titus 1.12. It's not showing up. Titus 1.12. Try it again, brother. Break it down or do something before I have to break some, some heads. Let me get it for you. Hold on. Titus 1.12. We're sailing along on a moon. I hope this doesn't give me problems with, with him trying to post because then I'm going to have to do it. Okay, Titus 1.12. All right, here you go. 
One of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said, one of the Cretans, Paul is quoting a Cretan, a prophet of theirs, not a true prophet of God, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. Paul, what are you doing quoting a false prophet? What are you doing quoting a false prophet, Paul, in Titus 1, verse 12? Because he's saying that even their own prophet recognizes their <clears throat> sinfulness and their corruption. One of their own is admitting this. So if Paul is setting a standard in which he's quoting the poets, the prophets of the pagans, false prophets, poets who are saying things about false gods, and taking that and Christianizing those statements and reclaiming those statements for the glory of the true God, who told you, who told you that you can't appeal to the Quran? Yes, it appears. Uh, thanks, verse last. One of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. So you can stick with the King James, brother, if you want. If it's giving our time, then something else. Are you, you with me there? Do you understand the two principles we just established from Scripture? Two principles, right? Number one, Satan tries to seduce you spiritually and cause you to lose, lose your spiritual virginity by putting up with a false Jesus, either the Mormon Jesus or the Muslim Jesus or the Jehovah's Witness Jesus or the Unitarian Jesus and a different spirit, different gospel. That's Satan's way of seducing you. Do not put up with it. Expose it. The second principle, number two, you can use the very sources, the very writings, the very words of these false prophets, of these pagans, of Muhammad, to prove the truth of the Christian faith. You want me there? Yeah. Christos Anesti said it. It's like asking, is water wet? Of course, Christian prince does an excellent job. Yep, they did that. Exactly. The Jirani Christians did that to Muhammad. So with that said, are we ready? Are we ready? Because I'm going to use the Quran to show from the Quran. <clears throat> Amen. Sujat Tipan. From the Quran, Jesus is better than Muhammad. And Muhammad is under the feet of Jesus. From the Quran. Not even the Bible. The Bible clearly. Jesus is the God of Muhammad, the judge of Muhammad, who gave life to Muhammad and damned Muhammad to hell. That's uh, according to our Bible. That's clear. From the Quran. Okay, so but now let's talk about. <clears throat> remember I talked about the articles of faith of Muslims. They believe there's only one God, Tawheed. We'll get back to that later. Second article of faith, the spirit realm, angels of jinn. Third article of faith, they must believe in the existence of prophets and messengers. So third article of faith and fourth article of faith. That's what I'm going to focus on. To be a true Sunni Muslim, you look like, may the Holy Spirit loosen my tongue, in Jesus' name. The third article of faith is you must believe Allah sent prophets and messengers. And with some of these messengers, he gave them books. Now, you understand I'm going to do more than one session on this, right? I can't just do one. According to Islamic tradition, not the Quran. The Sunni Islamic tradition, not the Quran. Are you paying attention? Let me give you the link. Here it is. So you know I'm not making it up. Okay. This is a Sunni Islamic online website that gives fatawa, religious rulings and opinions. You know you have Sheikh Google, you have e Sheikh. Okay. Now, according to Sunni Islamic tradition, guys, please, you're going to get blown away and blessed if you listen. Okay. I promise you. By the power of the Holy Spirit. And I'm getting excited. When I feel excited, I know that's a blessing from the Spirit coming on for the glory of Jesus. Praise the Holy Spirit. We love you, Holy Spirit. We worship you. Save us from ourselves. Okay, now, in Sunni Islamic tradition, it is believed that Allah sent about 124,000 prophets. And if you look here in this source, let me quote it. Okay. What happened here? I just had the link. Did I lose it? Oh, my goodness. Did I give you the long, wrong link? Hold on. What happened, bro? I think I gave you the wrong link, didn't I? Did I give you guys the right link? I lost the link. Oh, it's right here. Sorry, I gave you the wrong link, guys. Sorry. Yeah, get stuck for Allah. Here you go. Here's the right link. Here's the right link, guys. I'm sorry. The right link. This just tells you. We're saying the long, on the moonlight day. 
All right. Okay. Now, here's what the link says. He's asked the question. Okay. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Right. And if you notice the subheading, it's under 24,000 NBA, 313 messengers. I have been hearing from here and there that the number of the prophets that sent, that sent by Allah are 124,000. So is the number of the walis, is there any proof from the Quran or Sunna supporting this fact? Jazakum Allahu khayran. Answer. Bismillah rahman rahim I don't want to forget. Allahumma salli. Allah. Yeah, okay. Imam Siyuti in his Al-Hawi stated that Al-Hakim reported that Abu Dhar, Abu Dhar was a companion of Muhammad. Abu Dhar asked the Prophet, how many prophets and messengers there, there were? And the response was respectfully, 124,000 prophets and 313 messengers. Another nation says 315. Okay. So according to Sunni Islamic tradition, from Adam, the first prophet, pay attention here. From Adam, the first prophet, to Muhammad, Allah sent 124,000 prophets. Among them were 313 to 315 messengers. Okay. Now, other traditions I've heard say 125,000 prophets. Another was 225,000 prophets. But in Islam, you are told to believe, Sunni Islam, that from the time of Adam, who's the first prophet, Islamic <clears throat> Sunni theology says Adam was the first prophet till the time of Muhammad, 124,000 prophets. Among them, 313, 314, or 315 messengers. So in Islam, they make a distinction between a prophet and a messenger. Nabi, prophet, Rasul, messenger. Now, the Arabic word Rasul can also mean apostle. Everyone with me there? Everyone with me there? You with me there? Nabi, prophet, the Arabic word for prophet. Rasul, the Arabic word for messenger, but can also mean apostle. Notice, there are not as many apostles slash messengers as there are prophets there are less messengers than prophets they're only about 313 314 because in sunni islamic theology not every prophet is a messenger a prophet is not necessarily a messenger but if you're a messenger you're also a prophet yes you did you spelled it correctly christos anesti let me repeat again i don't want to confuse you i want you to make sure you get it you can be a prophet and not be a messenger. But if you're a messenger, you have to be a prophet. A messenger is automatically a prophet. But if you're a prophet, you're not necessarily a messenger. Do you want me there? You understand the difference? So in Islam, Adam is a prophet, but he may not be a messenger, an apostle. In fact, the Hadith say Noah was the first messenger sent to the nations. The first messenger sent to the nations. So understand the Sunni Islamic mindset. A prophet is not necessarily a messenger, but a messenger, to be a messenger, also has to be a prophet. Okay? You with me there? You understand what Islam is teaching? I can't move on until you get it. Now, yes, exactly, Ariel Gonzalez. A prophet is one who receives instruction from Allah, but a messenger does more than that, and I'll explain it. Now, According to Islam, the five greatest prophets and messengers. In fact, thank our brother, First Lance, will be posting Quranic verses. Chapter 33, verse 7, brother. If you can post chapter 33, verse 7. You'll get them later. Don't worry about it. Okay. And when we exacted a covenant from the prophets and from thee, O Muhammad, from Noah... Abraham, Moses, and Jesus, son of Mary, we took from them a solemn covenant. There are the five greatest messengers who are prophets, right there, mentioned by name. Notice four of them are biblical figures. The only one who's not in the Bible is Muhammad. Did you catch it? In Sunni Islam, the five greatest messengers are also prophets. Abraham, uh, Noah, I'm sorry, Noah, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad. Four out of the five are biblical characters. Four out of the five are biblical characters. Did you catch it? So these are the greatest prophets and messengers. Now, why is a prophet different from a messenger? So that if you're a prophet, you're not necessarily a messenger. And why the distinction? 
Why do Muslims distinguish between a prophet and a messenger? Because the Quran does. Chapter 22, verse 52 of the Quran, Surah Al-Hajj. And I'm trusting the Holy Spirit to enable me to recall these verses correctly and make no mistakes for the glory of Jesus. Okay? Chapter 22, verse 52. The Quran does. Okay, watch here. Chapter 22, verse 52. Okay. Okay, sorry. Like I said, it's going to buffer here and there, but don't panic. Just keep praying. Notice chapter 22, verse 52. Guys, read again. And we did not send before you any messenger or prophet. You see the distinction? Messenger or prophet. Except that when he spoke or recited, Satan threw into it misunderstanding, some misunderstanding, but Allah abolishes that which Satan throws in. Then Allah makes precise his verses, and Allah is knower and wise. Okay, do you see in that verse? Messenger or prophet. So they're not the same. Do you see that? You see they're not the same? Why don't you stop buffering, you little loser? I'm back online now. My goodness, you, you freaks. Why are you panicking? Man, dude. Right? Sinners. Do you guys see it? It's been back. Sinners, man, you guys are a bunch of losers. And if you're upset, tough luck. You are all losers. You know why you're losers? You want to know why you're all losers? Because you lost your weight of sin. You lost your burden of sin, so you're losers by losing your sin. Okay? Stinking losers. Okay, 22 verse 52. I told you it's going to buffer, so don't, don't panic. Exactly. No, Bill Shepherd. Don't read your biblical theology into the Quran, Bill Shepherd, before I lay hands on you. Okay? And we did not send before you any messenger or prophet, except that when he spoke or recited, Satan threw into it some misunderstanding, but Allah abolishes that which Satan throws in, then Allah makes precise his verses, and Allah is knowing and wise. Did you catch it? Okay. A messenger or a prophet, they're not the same. Okay, if you caught that, why are they different? What makes them different? I know Christos and Estes, you're not going to ask me a question that's not related to the topic, right? You're not going to do that, right, brother? You're not, right? I don't know what's wrong with your mind that you get off topic and you focus on something that's irrelevant. Okay? You want me to stop and talk about satanic verses? I don't know how much time I spend with this guy. Day in and day out, and he still doesn't get it. And he blames it on sleep depravity that he hasn't slept. Oh boy. Yeah. Okay. Let's 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 focus here. What's the difference between a messenger and a prophet? What's the difference between a messenger and a prophet? The Quran doesn't tell you. Okay. The Quran doesn't tell you. If you ask a Muslim, show me in the Quran the difference between a messenger and prophet, doesn't spell it out. Okay. But in Sunni Islamic theology, they'll tell you this. Here is what they'll tell you. A prophet receives revelations from Allah and commands, either for himself or for his community. A messenger goes beyond that. A messenger not only receives commands, but a messenger is given a scripture to pass on to his community. Are you listening here? Are you listening to how they define the difference? A messenger is given a scripture to pass on to his community, a book an inspired book, a revealed book, and a messenger has an authority to do something that a prophet doesn't have. A messenger can cancel out, abrogate a command given by a previous prophet or messenger. You understand the difference now? Exactly, Shahzud. A messenger is greater than a prophet, even though a messenger is also a prophet. So let me repeat it again. A messenger, Rasul, an apostle, he receives a scripture to pass on to his respective community. A messenger also has the authority to cancel out a command given by a previous prophet or a messenger. That's what they'll tell you. Are you with me there? That's what they'll tell you. <clears throat> a messenger, an apostle, can abrogate previous commands given by prophets before him or messengers before him. And a messenger is given a scripture to pass on to his community. Prophets are not given scripture. So I just want to make sure you got it.
Okay? We know it's a joke. So if you got it, if you did you get it? You understand the difference now? Okay. So Muhammad comes, he's a prophet and messenger, and he can say, Moses, Musa, and his Sharia and his law told the Israelites you can't have camel meat. I abrogate that for my community. I abrogate that from for my community. My community can consume camel meat. Moses said, Moses said to his people, his community, <clears throat> that you are to worship God collectively on the Sabbath. Muhammad comes says, I abrogate that for my community. My community gathers together on Friday. You see what's happening here? You understand this concept of abrogation? Nasuch, nasuch wa mansuch. Abrogating and abrogated. Abrogating and abrogated. This is taught in the Quran. Now, interestingly, a messenger also can abrogate a command he himself gave previously. A messenger can abrogate a command, cancel out a command he himself gave previously. And that's what the Quran says. The Quran says Muhammad would give a command on a certain day, and either the next day or sometime afterward, he would cancel it out. He would abrogate it. He would nullify it, annul it. And then the people started saying, man, this guy's a forger. He's a fake. The guy's a quack. The guy told us to do one thing last week, and now he's telling us to do something different. The guy's a quack. Now notice what Allah's response is. How does Allah, what does Allah say to their accusation? Chapter 16, verse 101. Mama, didn't you tell us do this yesterday? Yeah. Why are you now telling us something else? 16, verse 101. Watch here, 16, verse 101. But I have a challenge for you Christians. I have a challenge for you Christians. And when we put a revelation in place of another revelation, when we replace one revelation with another when we replace one revelation with another, and Allah knoweth best what he revealeth, they say, lo, thou art but inventing. Most of them know not. You are a forger. You're inventing stuff, man. You're making stuff up. What are you talking about? You told us this yesterday. Now you're telling me, you're a forger. You're an inventor. You're a liar, man. And what is the response? They don't understand why we're doing this. They don't understand, Muhammad. They don't understand the wisdom. And saying this today and then canceling out the next day. But we know why we're doing it. There's wisdom behind it. There's hikmah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala azwajal. All right. Now, here, this one is even better. Chapter 2, verse 106. Chapter 2, verse 106. This one's even better. This is even better. Let me know how they're doing in Discord. Thou shall pontificate. And if, if they have questions there, daughter of Christ or anyone, what they're saying. Okay, 2106. Read with me. 2106. Nothing of our revelation, even a single verse, do we abrogate or cause to be forgotten, but we bring in place one better or the like thereof. Knowest thou not that Allah is able to do all things? Now, I don't like this translation. Can you give me the Arbery one? Arbery one? Pay attention here. Arbery one, if you can get that. I like this one because I want you to catch what it does not say. What it does not say. Okay. And for whatever verse we abrogate, this is what it actually says. Guys, pay attention. It doesn't say nothing of our revelation. It doesn't say our revelation. Those of you who speak Arabic, confirm. It says whatever verse we abrogate. It doesn't say our revelation. Whatever verse we abrogate or cast into oblivion. Into oblivion, we bring a better or the like of it. Knowest thou not that God is powerful over everything? Post that one more time. One more time. Because I want you to catch the implication of this. And the reason why, there's a reason why I'm saying it doesn't say, never do we abrogate our verse. It doesn't say our verse. Now pay attention here. For whatever verse we abrogate or cast into oblivion, whatever verse we cancel out, Nullify or throw away. Cast into oblivion means throw away. You know, toss it aside. Right? <clears throat> we bring a better or the like, like of it. Now, let me bring out the problem with this assertion. When Muhammad is canceling out previous commands or <clears throat> setting aside previous commands, the people are saying, you're a forger, you're an inventor, you're a liar, you're making it up as you go along. Okay, so what's the response? Allah's response to Muhammad is, every time 
we cancel out a command or we toss it away, remove it completely, right? We will replace it with something better or similar. Now, folks, help me understand this. Something better or similar. According to a Sunni Islamic logic, Sunni Islamic belief, every verse of the Quran is the speech of Allah. The Quran is his uncreated eternal speech. It's his speech, his word, kalam Allah. Can you help me understand how can a part of Allah's speech be inferior to another part of his speech? Because notice it says, we're going to replace one part of my speech with something better. How can Allah's speech be better than some parts? Are you with me there? Do you understand the implication of this nonsense? How can Allah say we will replace one part of our speech with a better part of our speech? But I thought all of Allah's speech, and his entire speech is perfect. It's flawless. So then how can a part of his speech be better than another part? But then it's even worse. If you're going to replace one command with something similar like it, then why even replace it at all? At all, If it's like the command you canceled, why not just keep that command? I don't get it. It says something better or something like it. So then why didn't you go with the one that was better to begin with or the one that's like it? And if it's like it, why even cancel it out? Why even cancel it out? I don't get it. Why cancel, cancel it out? You see the point here? So this is why the real miracle of the Quran is that people think it's a miracle. They think Muhammad is a prophet when he's actually an agent of the devil. Now, let's look at a couple of verses and we're going to go into Jesus. Chapter 2, verse 136 of the Quran. And then I'm going to pre present a challenge to every one of you. Chapter 2, verse 136 of the Quran. Thank you, guys. Yes, If you can, I know it's hard. People are panicking. But if the Lord puts it in your heart, you want to support us to do this work, God bless you. Chapter 2, verse 136. Pay attention here. Say, say, Muhammad Muslim, say, we believe in Allah and that which has been revealed to us, meaning the Quran, and that which was revealed to Ibrahim, Ismail, and I, Ishaq, Isaac, and Yaqub, and the tribes, that which was given to Musa, Moses, and Isa, Jesus, and in that which was given to the prophets from their Lord. And we do not make any distinction between any of them, and to him do we submit. Did you catch it? Say, you believe in Allah. You believe in the revelation given to the prophets before you, the biblical prophets, and you believe in the Quran. Okay. Chapter 2, verse 285. Chapter 2, verse 285. When that Muslim has the courage to debate me so I can decimate him and your prophet, the son of Satan. Chapter 2, verse 285. Chapter 2, verse 285. Exactly, Punisher Lee. The messenger believes in what has been revealed to him from his Lord, and so do the believers. They believe, they all believe in Allah and his angels and his books and his messengers, right? We make no difference between any of his messengers, and they say, we hear and obey our Lord. Thy forgiveness do we crave, and to thee is the eventual course. So you see it, there's the articles of faith. Allah, angels, messengers, right? <clears throat> the books. We believe in it all. Okay? Now, chapter 4, verse 136. Well, you have a name, Crying Sam, so I don't know if you're making fun of me. If you are, then I'll give you a taste of your medicine out of luck because I love you. Chapter 4, verse 136. Focus, guys. Don't let the devil distract you. Focus. Chapter 4, verse 136. Oh, you who believe, believe in Allah and his messenger and the book which he has revealed to his messenger and the book which he revealed before, and whosoever disbelieves in Allah and his angels and his messengers and the last day. There's the articles of faith of Sunni Islam right there. He indeed strays off into a remote error. Chapter 4, verses 163 to 164. And then we begin. That's a background. You see what Muslims are supposed to believe about messengers and prophets, right? Chapter 4, verses 163 to 164. Surely we have revealed to you, we've given you inspiration, Wahi, as we have revealed to Nuh, Noah, right? And the prophets after him, and revealed to Ibrahim, Abraham, Ismail, Ishmael, 
Ishak, Isaac, Yaqub, Jacob, and the tribes, and Isa, Jesus, and Ayub, J Job, Yunus, Jonah, Harun, Aaron, Suleiman. That's these are all Arabic forms of their names. Solomon. And we gave to Dawood, alayhi salam. We gave to David. What did you give to David? There's a part missing because you didn't give anything to David. Let's try this again for this last. You're missing a part because it says we gave to David the Zubur, the Psalms. So, But in your translation, you didn't give anything to David. Yes, Sujath, it's the Bible. Okay. And we sent messengers. We have mentioned to you before and messengers we have not mentioned to you. And to Musa, Allah addressed his word, speak to him. See, that's the part for last. You drop the ball again, I'm going to hurt you, brother, and then I'm going to repent. And we and to David, we gave the book. It's Zubur, the Psalms. But then notice for 164 one more time. Here's the key. Chapter 4, verse 164, one more time. That was the point I was going to make, Magnificent Prophet. Okay. Notice 4164, and we sent messengers we have mentioned to you before, and messengers we have not mentioned to you. And to Moses, Musa, Allah spoke directly to him with his word. Now, that's why a Muslim cannot reject any prophets of the Bible, even those who are not mentioned. Because the Quran says to Muhammad, we mentioned some of their names, but some others, we didn't mention them by name to you. So a Muslim cannot reject any prophet of the Old Testament. Did you catch it? A Muslim cannot reject any, any prophet of the Old Testament. Because the Quran says we haven't mentioned all of them by name. There are many messengers we have not mentioned by name. You believe in all of them. In all of them. So you believe in Daniel, though he's not mentioned. You believe in Isaiah, Isaiah though he's not mentioned. You got to believe in them all. Even if they're not mentioned by name in the Quran. A related point, <clears throat> Sunni Islamic theology says there are no female prophets. Allah does not raise up female prophets because females are not fit psychologically and physiologically for the task. Let me repeat it again. In Islamic theology, specifically Sunni Islam, right? Females cannot be prophets and they cannot be leaders. Why? Because Muhammad taught and the Quran teaches women are intellectually physically, emotionally inferior. They are not fit psychologically, emotionally, physically for the role of leadership or prophethood. Let's contrast that with God's true word. What does God say? Does he raise up females to be prophets? Exodus 15 verse 20. She knows it if she studied the Quran, but she's a liar and deceiver because she belongs to the same demon that tormented her prophet and inspired him. Remember their father is the devil, a murderer and a liar. <clears throat> Exodus 15, 20, for those of you who want to know, does the Bible honor women as prophets? Yep, Exodus 15, 20. And Miriam, that's the sister of Moses and Aaron, the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a timbrel in her hand, and all women, the women went out after her with timbrels and with dances. Judges chapter 4, verse 4. Judges chapter 4, verse 4. Muhammad is, is, is uh, speaking. You hear that bark? That was Muhammad. Okay. Judges 4, verse 4. And Deborah, a prophetess. Deborah, a prophetess. The wife of Lampidoth. She judged Israel at the time. So she was a prophetess and a leader of Israel with Barak. You catch it there? Miriam was also a leader over Israel. Under the headship of Moses. Okay, let me show you. Micah chapter 6 verse 4. Micah chapter 6 verse 4. Micah chapter 6 verse 4. Okay, watch here. For I brought thee up out of the land of Egypt and redeemed thee out of the house of servants, and I sent before thee Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. I sent you three leaders, Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. To bring you out of Egypt. You catch it? For I brought thee up out of the land of Egypt, redeemed thee out of the house of servants, and I sent before thee Moses, Arian, and Miriam. Punish your lead. Do me a favor. Do not post verses. Don't distract me. Listen. That's how you're going to help me to help you. Is that clear? You with me there? Isaiah chapter 8, verse 3. 
Isaiah chapter 8, verse 3. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 3. And I went unto the prophetess, and she conceived. Isaiah's wife was a prophetess. His wife was a prophetess like he was a prophet. Because he says, I went into her, meaning I slept with her. I had sex with her, and she conceived and bare a son. Then said Jehovah the Lord to me, call his name Mahar Shalal Hajbaz. Say that five times fast. Mahar Shalal Hajbaz. Okay. Can you imagine your parents are prophets? Husband and wife who are prophets filled with the Spirit, receiving revelation from the Spirit to preach, proclaim the Word of God to God's people. So you can say, hey, my mom and dad are prophets. What about your parents? Hey, my dad's a construction worker and my wife, my mom's a secretary. My parents are prophets. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm cool. Sucks being you. Right? You got it? All right. Okay, Acts 2, 36 to 38. Mr. Adam, be patient, my brother from a different mother. We're going to get to Anna. You hate her. Acts 2, 36 to 38. And you know, your parents are going to have to be a prophet if they name you Mahar Shalal Hajbas. Because you're going to be picked on and bullied with that kind of name. Acts 2, 36 to 38. Therefore, let all the house of Israel assuredly know. Oh, I'm sorry. Luke 2, 36, 38. Do you see what you did, Arun? Because you got to chime in, and I got discombobulated. Luke 2, 36 to 38. Arun, I'm going to fly to your place and lay hands on you, buddy. Luke 2, 36 to 38. And there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher, Asher. She was of great age and had lived with the husband seven years from her virginity. And she was a widow of about four score and four years, 84 years, which departed not from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And she coming in that instant gave thanks likewise unto the Lord and spake of him to all them that looked for redemption in Jerusalem. Did you catch it? Here was a virgin who got married, lived with her husband seven years. Her husband then died. Seven years after the marriage, he died. She remained a widow and celibate for all her life so that when Jesus was born and presented temple, she was 84 years old and she was a prophetess praying and fasting, filled with the spirit. And when she saw Jesus, she prophesied, that's the one. Okay. Finally, Acts 21, 8 to 9. Acts 21, verses 8 to 9. Finally. You're seeing the difference between the Bible and the Quran and the Sunnah of Muhammad, biblical Christianity, and Sunni Islam. Acts 21, verses 8 to 9. And the next day, we that were of Paul's company departed and came unto Caesarea, and we entered into the house of Philip the Evangelist. Now watch this. Philip the Evangelist, which was one of the seven, meaning seven original deacons, Acts 6, verses 1 to 5, Acts 6, verses 1 to 5, and abode with him. You can read Acts 6, verses 1 to 6 as well. Verse 6 as well. And the same man, Philip, had four daughters who were virgins, which did prophesy. He had four virgin prophetesses. Four virgin daughters who were prophetesses who prophesied by relation of the Holy Spirit. Can you imagine that? Your daughters, all prophets filled with the Spirit to glorify Christ. I beg the Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, my Lord, his beloved, by the power of the Holy Spirit, my two daughters become filled with the Spirit to glorify and proclaim the praise of Jesus, their Lord and Savior. Okay, so now that we got all that, let's talk a little bit about Isa. Let me give you a quick rundown of what Sunni Islam teaches about Jesus, and that's where we're going to unpack it. Unpack it. That's where I'm going to do another session showing you the Quranic Jesus, let me repeat, the Quranic Jesus is not the true Jesus. It's a counterfeit of Satan. But God, who is sovereign and almighty over Satan, worked in such a way to allow Satan to inspire Muhammad to say certain things about this false Jesus that you can then use to bring them to the true Jesus. 
Okay? Now, quick rundown of what Sunni Islam teaches about Jesus. Are you ready? Now, you guys know it, but I have to give this quick rundown for those Christians who don't know. There are many Christians who don't know. They don't know. Okay, here it is. The commonalities and differences. And I'll show you this later when we unpack the meat. When we unpack the meat. You cannot be a Muslim if you deny the virginal, virginal conception and birth of Jesus. The Quran acknowledges and confirms. Jesus' mother, her name was Maryam, Mary. She conceived, got pregnant by the Spirit of Allah without sexual intercourse. She was a virgin when she conceived and a virgin when she gave birth. No man touched her physically. So the Quran affirms that. The Quran also affirms that Jesus is sinless, faultless, and absolutely pure. And I will go into the Quran and show you that. I'm just giving you a quick rundown. The Quran acknowledges that Jesus is the Messiah, and Messi, the Christ. He's the only Christ, the only Messiah mentioned by name in the Quran. The Quran calls him the word of Allah, the word of Allah, and a spirit from him. So in Islamic theology, Jesus is called Kalimat Allah, Word of Allah, and Ruh Allah, the Spirit of Allah. Okay. The Quran acknowledges Jesus was a miracle worker. He raised the dead. He breathed life into clay birds. We're going to look at this later. So excuse the rundown. We're going to go into all this, I promise you. The Quran says that Jesus would fashion a bird from clay. And breathe into that bird, and then the bird would become a living bird come to life. In other words, the Quran acknowledges Jesus had the breath of life. Jesus, by his breath, could give life to inanimate objects. And we're going to unpack the implication of that in a future session, if not in this session. So Jesus gave life to clay birds, raised the dead, gave sight to the blind, cleansed lepers, and the Quran says that Jesus would announce what people hid in their homes. What people hid in their homes. Okay? You with me there? So, now Abdullah Aman, he's going to be a case study where I'm going to embarrass him and show him that Jesus is better than his prophet. Aren't you glad a Muslim showed up? Glory to Jesus. Because now he's going to help me make my case. He's going to help me make my case. Abdullah Aman. Are you ready? Thank the Lord. Two birds with one stone. Are you ready? Are you ready to help me make my case? Because I'm going to call you out. In fact, do you want to call me on Skype, Abdullah Man? I'll open the Skype. You can call me. Are you ready for it? Let's see if he's going. Because, man, he may, he, the Lord may have brought him here. Do you want to call me on Skype? Come on, Abdullah Man. Don't be ashamed. No, I want to engage you because you're going to prove my case that even your Isa is better than your Muhammad. That your Muhammad is under the feet of your Isa. Isa is better than your prophet, even according to your Quran, which is false. Do you want to call me or do you want to answer in text? Do you want to call me or do you want to answer in text? Let's just see. Which one do you want to do? Let's see if he's going to do it. If not, then we'll ignore him. Okay, in the text, you want to answer in the text? He doesn't want to call, folks. So you want to do it in the text? Thank the Lord when he brings these people to confirm our arguments. He doesn't want to do it. You can't force him. Let's see. You're going to answer in the text? Let's see. Let's just see. Okay, if you're going to listen to my arguments, don't chime in until I'm done. But let me refute your canard. It says, be ithni Allah. You said he did it by the permission of Allah. Okay. You understand what be ithni Allah means? Or do I have to correct you even your so-called knowledge of Arabic? Let me show you the verse he's referring to. Let's go to chapter 3, verse 49. Chapter 3, verse 49. Use the Arbery translation. Use the Arbery translation, brother. Because the Muslims like to distort the Arabic. Okay? And we got Arabic speakers. I'll confirm what I'm about to say. Guys, this is where when you see I'm about to debate, do me a favor. Don't even text. Just pull back and pray. 
Because we don't just want to demolish his arguments. We want to save him from the lies of Muhammad for the glory of Jesus. Okay. Here is what the Quran says about Jesus. The false Jesus. Okay. But listen. To be a messenger to the children of Israel saying, I have come to you with a sign from your Lord. I will create for you out of clay. I will create for you out of clay. This is supposedly Jesus speaking. As the likeness of a bird, then I will breathe into it and it will be a bird, be it me Allah, by the leave of Allah. I also, I will also heal the blind and the leper and bring life to the dead, be it me Allah, by the leave of Allah. Okay, now, first question for you, Abdullah. One of the names of your God is Al Khaliq. This verb in Arabic, Khalaqa, the word create, Khalaqa. Can you show me where this verb is used? For someone other than Allah and Jesus. For those of you who don't know Arabic, the verb create, khalaqa, is only used of Allah and Jesus in the Quran. The verb is never used for anyone besides Allah and Jesus. Does the Quran use the verb khalaqa for someone other than Allah and Jesus? Yes or no? Yes or no? You see why it's important to learn the Quran? You see, he just admit no. Thank you. Now you're being honest. I respect you. Did you catch it? He said, no. The verb khalaqa only used for Allah and Jesus. That's the first point. The verb to create only used for Allah and Jesus. Guys, see it. Look what he's saying. Secondly, is it not true that Allah, according to the Quran, created Adam from clay? Teen? Same word? Clay? And is it not true that Allah made Adam alive by breathing the spirit into him? So Adam was created from clay. Allah breathed into him the spirit and Adam came to life. Or do I need to quote the ayat to prove that point? Yes or no? Is that how Allah created Adam? Okay, so he admit yes. Guys, understand what he just admit. Allah created Adam from clay. Same Arabic word. And how did Adam come to life? Allah breathed into him the spirit. Adam came to life. So guys, notice what he just admit. Jesus creates exactly like Allah does. Jesus creates in the same way that Allah does. Jesus is a creator equal to Allah because he creates the same way that Allah creates. Jesus, like Allah, takes clay, fashions a creature. Jesus, like Allah, makes that creature come to life by breathing life into him. He just admit that. Okay. Is there anyone else in your Quran that creates from clay and breathes into it and makes it alive by Allah's permission besides Jesus? Anyone else? Anyone else besides Jesus in your Quran? In your Quran. Guys, you see, he admit no. Man, you're honest. I hope God opens your heart. Now, can you show me someone other than Allah and Jesus that raised the dead? Show me in your Quran. Guys, don't chime in. We know it's a miracle. Creation is a miracle. But Jesus does the miracle exactly the way your God does it. Don't chime in. Let him focus. Don't keep texting. Hold your excitement. Okay. Can you show me someone other than your God and Jesus raising the dead? Can you show me someone other than your God and Jesus raising the dead? In the Quran. In the Quran. Don't go to my Bible. In the Quran. Wow. You Now, for the Christians, are you seeing why you need to be listening to these sessions? Do you see God brought this man, hopefully to save him, but to confirm why you need to learn these arguments? Are you seeing it? He just admit no. He's just admitting... Jesus is better than his own prophet without realizing it. Okay? You understand? Now, be ithni Allah is not the same thing as Allah giving you quwa, power. Be ithni means Allah is giving you permission. Now, let me explain the difference, Abdullah. I'm going to give you an analogy. I give you permission to drive my car. But giving you permission to drive my car is not the same thing as giving you the ability to drive. You have to have the ability to drive for me to give you permission to take my car for a cruise. But if I give my eight-year-old daughter permission to drive, I can give her permission all day, all night. 
She lacks the ability to drive. She can't do it. The very fact that your God is giving Jesus permission to do the miracle shows that Jesus has to have that ability to do what Allah permits him to do. It doesn't say he gave him the ability. It says he permits him to do what he does. Are you with me there, Abdullah? Did everyone else get it? You understand the difference between giving permission and giving someone ability? Empowering someone. It doesn't say Allah empowered him. It says Allah permitted him to do it. So I can permit my eight-year-old, go drive the car. She can't. I can give her permission to drive it, but she can't drive it. She'll wreck the car and kill herself. So when it says Allah gave him permission, that doesn't mean Allah gave him the power to do it. He's permitting him to exercise a power he possesses by nature. One means yes. Two means no. Exactly, Punisher Lee. Permission, not ability. Now, focus, guys. I know you guys are getting excited. Control and constrain yourself. Notice you can't constrain. Don't distract this guy. Christos Anesti. I think I'm going to have to block you from my channel. Chapter 3, verse 49. It says, by the leave of Allah, by the permission of Allah. We just read it. Ya Rasulullah. All right. You with me there? Okay. Yes, Francis. Now, folks, brethren, you know you guys are shaming yourselves when I keep saying don't text and you keep texting. Why can't you Christians constrain yourself? Don't you have the ability to do so? Why do you guys have to text when I'm saying please don't text so this guy can focus and read what I'm hear what I'm saying? I just did, 359, that's going to backfire against you. See, can I engage this young man? Can I engage this young man? See, he's now asking me a question, 359. Can you not text, you guys? Honestly, can you not text? Do you want to be an obstacle to this guy? Because if you text, you're going to distract him to read your text. When I want him to focus on me with the hopes he'll get saved. Okay, 359. Let's see how many Christians... Can control themselves. Let's see. Let's see if you can constrain yourselves. And you wonder why I get tough with you guys. 359. Post it again. <clears throat> Truly, the likeness. I don't believe what Nada just did. Truly, the likeness of Jesus in God's sight is as Adam's likeness. He created him of dust, then said un he unto him, Thanks for failing the test, Nada. Good job. Uh, then said he unto him, Be, and he was. Okay, now. Here's his question. It says, Allah likens Jesus to Adam. So Adam and Jesus are alike, so Jesus isn't special. So Abdullah, are you now ready for me to respond to that? Are you ready for me to respond to that? Are you ready? You guys want to see this man get saved? Don't text. We want this guy not just to refute him, but win him to Christ. Okay. Okay. Let me ask you a question. First question. <clears throat> Did Adam make a mistake? Did Adam make a mistake? When he ate of the forbidden tree? Did he make a mistake? Did Jesus ever make a mistake? According to the Quran. Did Jesus ever make a mistake? Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Did Adam raise the dead? Did he raise the dead? Did Adam breathe life into clay objects and bring them into being, made them living beings? Yes, yeah, send PS out of here, block him. Okay. Did, uh, did Adam give sight to the blind? Did Adam give sight to the blind? Okay. Did Adam cleanse lepers?
When Adam died, was he taken to Allah or did he return to the dust, to the grave? This is all from your Quran, nothing from the Bible. He returned to the dust, he's in the grave, right? Grave, okay. Jesus, when Allah took him, did he take him to the grave or Allah took him to himself, according to the Quran? Chapter 3, verse 55 and chapter 4, verse 158. Did Allah take him to himself or did Allah bury Jesus in a grave? Okay. Did you catch it, guys? This is all from the Quran. All right. Now, since Adam was the first man, could he have parents? Could he have a father and mother if he's the first man? Because he's the first man, could he have a mother and father? Okay. Eve, because she's the first woman, could she have a, could she have a mother? Could she have a mother if she's the first woman? No. Since Jesus was born at a time where there were millions of people born from father and mother, could Jesus have been born from a father and a mother if Allah wanted? He could have had a father and a mother, right? If that's what Allah wanted, right? He could have. Right? Okay. But now you just set yourself up. Adam could not have parents. He's the first man. Impossible for him to have a father and mother then he wouldn't be the first man. Eve could not have a mother. She's the first woman. But why did Jesus have to be born of a virgin when that wasn't necessary? Why him? He could have been born from a father and mother, but for some reason, God chose, he'll be born of a virgin, not from a man. Why? Send this guy out of here, this filthy dog that's insulting Muhammad. Because he's now going to be a stumbling block to Abdullah. Why? Why the virgin birth? It wasn't necessary. Adam's creation was necessary. He had no parents. Eve could not have a mother. She's the first woman. But why then have Jesus born of a virgin when it wasn't necessary? Could have came through a father and mother. Why? Why? Okay, another question. Can you show me anywhere in the Quran? Anywhere in the Quran? The Bible does. Guys, he's so honest. He says the Quran never gives a reason. Thank you. Guys, this guy, pray. It looks like the Spirit's working in him. Glory to the triune God. But don't comment, guys, please. We want to win these people to Christ, not lose them if they're not blasphemers. Okay. Not, oh, my goodness. Allahu Akbar. Amelia, you, I got to get rid of you too so you can learn. This is for your sake. Learn to control yourselves. Because you guys, what a shame you guys can't control yourselves. What is wrong with you guys? Okay, coming back to the issue now. Let's come back to this issue. Can you show me where Adam is called Karimat Allah, the word of Allah, a word from Allah, his word, where the Quran says Adam is a word of Allah, his word. Does the Quran call him the word? Anywhere? Does the Quran? Thank you. It calls Jesus. Yes. Jesus is called the Word of God, but not Adam, right? Adam's never called the Word of God, right? Adam's never called the Word. Ah. Uh, can you show me where the Quran says Adam is a spirit from Allah? Where it says Adam is a spirit from Allah. Not that Allah breathed his spirit into him to make him alive, because it's Allah's spirit that makes us all alive. Where it says, Adam is a spirit from Allah. Does the Quran say he's a spirit from Allah? Does it? A spirit from Allah? Thank you. But now let's see what the Quran says about Asa, Jesus. Chapter 4, verse 171. Chapter 4, verse 171. Watch here. Did Albionis just come in here? Doesn't know the rule not to comment while I'm discussing with the Muslim, or has Albionis been here for a while? People of the book, go not beyond the bounds of your religion and say, this is Surah An-Nisa, not as to God, but the truth. The Messiah Jesus and Messiah Isa ibn Maryam was only the messenger of Allah, and his word, kalimatuhu, his word, that he committed to Mary and a spirit from him, ruhin min, 
Now, let me ask you a question. Do you know the Arabic of the Quran? Do you know the Arabic of the Quran or no? If you don't, that's okay. Do you or you don't? Do you know it or you don't? I just want to ask. If you don't, that's okay, man. If you don't know. Do you know the Arabic of the Quran? Can you read the Arabic Quran or no? Hopefully you hear. Don't be distracted. Okay. Do you know then in Surah Al-Nisa it says, Kalimatuhu Al-Qaha Illa Maryam, right? Kalimatuhu Al-Qaha Illa Maryam, right? Can you read and confirm? That's what it says, right? Jesus is Kalimatuhu, His word, the word of Allah, Al-Qaha Illa Maryam. Sent down upon Mary, cast down upon Mary, right? Thank you, you admit that. Now let me ask you a question. If your Quran just said, Jesus is God's word that was cast down to Mary. He's the word that Allah threw down to Mary and he came as a spirit from him. You just proved that Jesus was there with Allah before he was born of Mary and he came down from Allah as a spirit and entered Mary to become flesh. So you just proved Jesus was already there existing with Allah, up high with Allah and came down. Kalimatuhu al-Qaha came down to Mary as a spirit from him. You just proved that Jesus existed before he became a man from your Quran. In what way is Adam like Jesus then? You just helped me refute what the Quran said. Adam is nothing like Jesus. Jesus is better and greater than Adam, even Muhammad. And from your Quran, I didn't use the Bible. You just proved it for me. Let me ask you another question. Are you ready? I'm going to ask you another question, Abdullah. Are you ready? Are you ready for another question? Hopefully he's listening. Okay. Is the name of Muhammad's mother mentioned in the Quran? Is the name of Muhammad's mother mentioned? Don't block this guy. It's okay. King of Kings, don't comment. Just sit. Don't block. Is the name of Muhammad mother or his wives, or his daughters, mentioned in the Quran. She mentioned in the Quran, quote the ayah. Where does it say Muhammad's mother, Amina? Is she mentioned in the Quran? Is her name mentioned in the Quran? Does the Quran mention her name? Okay. Does the Quran mention the names of the wife of Adam, the wives of Ibrahim, the wives of Musa? Does it mention any woman's name with the exception of Jesus' mother? Is it not true Jesus' mother is the only woman mentioned by name? The Quran only mentions the mother of Christ by name, Maryam, Mary. She's the only woman mentioned by name in the Quran. Is that not true? True or yes or no? Thank you. She said only Maryam. You know. All right. Now, is it also not true that according to the Quran, Mary is the greatest woman of all and absolutely pure? Chapter 3, verse 42 of the Quran. That your Quran says Mary is the greatest woman of all and absolutely pure, like Jesus, her son. Chapter 3, verse 42. Chapter 3, verse 42. Chapter 3, verse 42. And when the angel said, Mary, God has chosen thee and purified thee and has chosen thee above all women. So you agree with the Quran. Quran says... Mary is chosen and pre preferred above all women, and she's pure. You agree, right? There's no debate because your Quran says it. Guys, did you hear what he just said? The mother of Jesus is the greatest. Don't text, but listen. The mother of Jesus is the greatest. Okay. Isn't it true that in Sahih Muslim... Sahih Muslim, Muhammad's mother is in hell. And that when Muhammad prayed that Allah would forgive his mother, Allah refused. Should I read Sahih Muslim? Do you want me to read Sahih Muslim? Or do you, you admit? Yes. Sahih Muslim, the Hadith collection says, when Muhammad prayed for his mother, Amina, Allah said, don't pray for her because she was a kafira. Okay, guys, you see, just admit it. 
Muhammad's mother was an idol worshiper. When Muhammad asked Allah to forgive his dead mother, Allah said no. And yet Muhammad is supposed to be the greatest. And yet Mary, Jesus' mother, is the greatest woman of all. You hear what you just said, Abdullah? You just admitted to the Christians. Your Quran makes Jesus better, superior to Muhammad. Jesus' mother is the greatest woman ever created because she's the mother of Jesus. He makes her great. And Muhammad's mother is in hell. And you're still a Muslim. Why? Why are you still a Muslim? Why don't you come to the truth of the Bible, to the real Jesus, your only hope of salvation? I want to give you this article, and I want you to read it for yourself. This is an article that I wrote, and I want you to save that article. I use the Quran to prove, and I use your Hadith to prove, Jesus is better than your prophet. And Muhammad was a sinner whom Allah rebuked, and yet... Jesus' mother is the greatest woman ever created, and Muhammad's mother is in hell. Okay, so now that said, guys, you can chime in. We're done. Thank you, Abdullah. You can sit back and listen. That's it. Now, guys, chime in. Now you can chime in. Go ahead. God bless you that you can change yourself. Sorry I had to get because I want to focus on him. I want him to see the truth. Okay? You guys, you know what happened right now for the Christians? God gave you a case study. You just saw that these arguments are irrefutable. Did you see it now? Are you seeing it now? That the arguments we're giving you are irrefutable. Spiritually battle-tested arguments that if you learn to use, you will rock the foundation of the Muslims with the hopes they come to Jesus and fall in love with Jesus and be saved because we're not trying to destroy them. We're trying to save them from the lie. You seeing it now? You see how many confirmations our glorious triune God, how many confirmations the Lord Jesus is giving you that praise the Lord for his love and mercy. He has blessed us, David Wood, myself, Christian Prince, to be used by the Spirit to give you arguments to see these people get saved, which is why you need to be praying for us that God makes us holy and pure and live for Jesus, gives us the health we need to continue to do this and be bold. And provide for us. Because Muslims need to get saved. You got it? And do you see now why you got to save the links to the articles? Did you save the links? Honestly, do you think this was coincidence or this was divinely designed? God brought this man so he could hear the truth and use him to show you this is what you need to be doing, Christians. Study this because I'm going to use you to get Muslims saved. But you need to be the best possible spokesperson for Jesus. All right? You get it? So you saw it, folks. Everything I used here in the articles. So now let me give you a rundown quickly about what they believe about Jesus. You saw it with your eyes, right? You heard it. And then we're going to do a part two, God willing. Part two. You saw it, right? I hope after this session, you go on your knees and just cry out saying, how amazing are you? How real are you? You are alive. Lord Jesus, you live and the Bible is your word, your truth, and no one can stand against you. Honestly, he is more real than you can imagine. Our Lord is alive. Jesus lives and we will live. May we never doubt him, never shame him, never fail him. Now, with that said, real quick, quick rundown. Sunni Islam in the Quran teaches, Jesus, you, you heard it by the way, born of a virgin, his mother is the greatest woman ever created, sinless, the only woman mentioned by name in the Quran. There's a chapter named after her, chapter 19, the chapter of Mary. That's how great Jesus is, that the Quran even has a chapter named in the, in the honor of his mother, not Muhammad's mother. The tradition says Muhammad's mother is in hell. Jesus is the Messiah. The word of God, the spirit of God, a miracle worker. The, the Quran also says Allah took Jesus physically, bodily to himself. And the Islamic traditions teach, the Islamic traditions teach, Jesus will return physically, bodily from heaven to the earth. When he returns to the earth, he will kill the Antichrist, Al-Masih, Al-Dajjal. So Islam teaches, Sunni Islam, when I say Islam, you know I mean Sunni Islam. Not all forms of Islam teach this. Sunni Islam and Shia Islam, they both agree, the false Christ will come, Jesus comes down and kills him, 
then Jesus rules on the earth as a just judge. This is what Islam teaches about Jesus. Now, the difference is, the difference is, the Quran says Jesus is not Allah and he's not the son of Allah. He's not Allah and he's not the son of Allah. And according to Islamic tradi tr tradition, according to Islamic tradition, not the Quran, even though it's misinterpreted to make it say such, Jesus did not die on the cross, even though he's taken physically body to heaven. And according to Islamic tradition, not the Quran. According to Islamic tradition, not the Quran. It's not in the Quran. Sunni Islamic tradition, the tradition of Sunni Islam. When Jesus returns to judge, he will rule for 40 years as a judge. He'll get married. He'll have a couple of children, at least two sons named Musa and Muhammad. Then he will die. They're going to bury him next to Muhammad in Medina. And then at the last trumpet, Jesus will be raised with Muhammad. And then comes either, either punishment in hell or eternal everlasting life in Jannah. That's what Muslims believe. Now, with that said, you got a blessing. You got a Muslim whom God brought to see the arguments are irrefutable with the hopes the seed is planted and he gets saved. In Jesus' name, Lord, bring him out of this darkness and to your feet because you love him. You created him for your glory. You should now have confidence. Okay, Abdullah Aman. Okay, good. Guys, he just brought up another point. Before I end it, Abdul, Abdullah Aman, are you ready now? Because you just mentioned Lam Yalid wa Lam Yulad. Okay, are you ready? Guys, now I need you to, because he's now going to make another confirmation of another point that you need to learn. Okay, guys, silence now. Control yourself. Abdullah. You don't believe that Allah can have a son, right? Lam yalad wa lam yulad. He doesn't have a son. Why? Why can't Allah have a son? Guys, listen. Don't text. Please constrain yourself by the power of the Holy Spirit in you. Okay. Why can't Allah have a son? Okay. Why does having a son make him unholy? Why does having a son make him unholy, Abdullah? Okay, so you're saying Allah can only have a son if he has sex, right? That's what you just said? Lightning round, get lightning out of here. He's got to go. Get him out of here, please. Quick. Okay. Are you with me here? So you guys learn to control yourself. Shame on you if you Christians can't control yourself. Shame on you guys, man. You can't control yourself when you have the Holy Spirit? Unbelievable, you guys. Anyway, Abdullah Aman, listen. So you're saying Allah can't have a son unless he has sex. And if he has sex, that's unholy. Okay. Did Mary have sex when she gave birth to Jesus? Did she have sex? Did she have sex when she gave birth to Jesus? And when Mary gave birth to Jesus, did she become unholy or was she still holy? Because the Quran says that her son would be holy from birth. Send Fun White out of here too. Any distraction, don't even ask. Block them. Get them out of here. Did Okay, so wait. Mary had a son without having sex, and it didn't make her unholy. So why can't your God have a son without having sex? Why is it Mary can't have a son without having sex, but your God cannot have a son unless he has sex? Is Mary greater than, than Allah? Okay, send this guy out of here too. Everyone, even if it's a Christian minister, get them out of here. Keep commenting, Christians, so you can be blocked from my channel. Keep disrespecting the conversation. So Allah can only have a son if he has sex. But Mary, who is a creature, had a son without sex and she was still holy. So is Mary greater than Allah? Oh, guys, rejoice with me. Now you can comment. He said, good question. The man is thinking. Now you can comment and pray for him. Now you can comment and pray for him. Glory to Jesus that he brought you, Abdullah. We pray the Holy Spirit keeps convicting your heart and fill you with his love and bring you out of Islam. Lord Jesus, shine his face on you. Lord Jesus, show you how much he loves you and bring you to him by his spirit. You need the real Jesus of the Bible, not the ace of the Quran. Rejoice with me, folks. Rejoice. The man is shaken for the glory of Jesus Christ. 
You see? And you saw how now to witness the Muslims and how not to witness the Muslims. You saw it. But I'm going to repeat to the, to the Christians here. Christians, do you want to benefit from these sessions? Do you want me to help you to help me to help you? When I say don't text, it's not I'm trying to be mean or rude. I want him not to be distracted by Satan. And Satan can even use us to distract him. So can you trust me by the grace of God when I say no texting, no texting, please? Okay, folks, it's now 1.16 p.m. my time. 1.16 p.m. my time, which it was what's in New York. 4.16 p.m. New York time, Eastern Standard Time, God willing. Lord willing, I'm going to do another session on being born again. Will you guys come if I do that session? Because we had about 150 today. I want to see that same number. Don't discourage me. Because now you're going to learn about being born again. God willing, Lord willing. Let's see what time. So 2 p.m. Okay, we're going to try for 4.30, 5 p.m. my time. 4.35 p.m. would be 7.30, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. 7.30, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So New York time, 7.30, 8 p.m., which is my time, 4.35 p.m., okay? So check back. Invite people. This is important. Born again. Invite Christians, okay? I hope you're blessed. Yes. I hope you're excited. I hope you're encouraged. I hope you're blown away. I hope now you're more confident that these arguments are battle-tested, perfected by the power of the Holy Spirit, and God is using us to show you how to witness and how not to witness for the glory of Jesus. Christ is risen, risen indeed. We love you, Jesus. Pray now for Abdullah Aman. He got rocked. You see what he said? Good question. Glory to the triune God. The man got to hear another side that he's never been exposed to. Glory to you, Lord Jesus. You love Muslims, and they belong to you. You created them for your glory. Thank you for using us to bring them to your feet. Glory to you, Son of God. Keep us in love with you. Christ is risen, risen indeed, in Jesus' name.